everyone. Welcome to another exciting session of the Smart Protein Summit. My name is Ambika Hirnandani and I serve as a strategic partnership specialist at the Good Food Institute India. This session is particularly exciting because we will be putting a spotlight on the work underway to support smart protein in one of the world's most technologically progressive countries, Singapore. The Singapore food story and its goal of achieving 30% of its food locally by 2030 is truly visionary. The government announced funding of up to $144 million into the Singapore Food Stories R&D program in 2019. A major theme of this investment is a focus on alternative protein. At the center of these developments supporting this sector has been ASTAR, the Agency for Science, Technology and Research. And today we will be speaking to Mr. Yi Kuang Sek, who is the director at ASTAR. Mr. Sek is the director of the Industry Development Group at ASTAR and he focuses on biomedical sciences and heads up the Industry Partnership Office. Welcome, Mr. Sek. Could you tell us a little bit about ASTAR, which is your agency and your role yeah. in supporting this transformative innovation? Because this is a fledgling industry, but I mean, it, it, it could, it, the potential is limitless in this industry. So could you yeah. tell us a little bit about ASTAR, your role and you know, where you see it going? Sure. Um, so, uh, first about ASTAR. So, what is ASTAR? So, ASTAR stands for Agency for Science and Technology and Research. Uh, it is a government-funded uh, re translational research organization. Uh, uh, and uh, the areas of R&D uh, that we go into uh, uh, has two objectives. Uh, one for economic development, uh, to be able to grow and build new industries uh, in Singapore, but also for national or social or outcomes like you know improving healthcare, uh, improving the urban environment, uh, water security, and things like that. Uh, we are a five thousand man strong organization, uh, very international in nature. About uh, four thousand of the five thousand people are you know PhD scientists, researchers, and engineers. Uh, we, because of our mandate, we cover various sectors uh, that are important for Singapore. Uh, and we have been focusing on food and the food and nutrition space for, I would say, about uh, eight to ten years. Uh, and I guess in the recent years, uh, we started looking at, hey, you know, what else can we do in the food space? And that's where uh, alternative proteins uh, and the various aspects of alternative proteins started to get interesting for us. Uh, we've been monitoring trends in the last uh, three, four years, and I think we really started to, you know, uh, watch this space and uh, invest capabilities uh, in building this space in terms of R&D, getting the scientists interested uh, in the last two years. Um, I, I guess the way that we do it is, as I mentioned, a lot of industry sensing, technology foresighting, and then, you know, uh, putting up to our, uh, uh, you know, council, scientific councils and public sector agencies to say, hey, we should invest uh, in this area uh, in terms of public sector R&D that ultimately leads to technologies and capabilities that we can partner with industry uh, to start new companies or even attract new companies to Singapore. Uh, so that's our approach. Uh, and uh, you know, in, in the alternative protein space. Uh, it's not just ASTAR, we do work with the universities also uh, uh, across Singapore and the polytechnics. Uh, so I would say it's a whole of public sector um, uh, uh, R&D agency approach in terms of addressing uh, alternative proteins. Uh, it's been very exciting for us. Uh, and uh, uh, ASTAR has certain capabilities that we can leverage. So that's the beauty of, of uh, alternative protein. So, uh, for example, uh, in microbial proteins, um, we actually three years ago started building a platform or program uh, that looks at leveraging the microbial system to generate um, flavors, fragrance, and food ingredients uh, uh, using the um, fermentation and, and, and you know finding the mi right microbes, engineering the right microbes that can produce this. But, and that has been very successful. But then, hey, with alternative proteins, you know, uh, we can also leverage the microbial world to uh, whether it's uh, find new strains or engineer strains that can, you know, do protein production. So it's kind of like this thing about 
what capabilities that we have, can we leverage it into other sectors? So that's one example. Uh, the other example would be cell-based needs. So um, ASTAR has been a very strong player or you know, has put in very strong efforts in building uh, um, research and drug development in the pharmaceutical space, all right? And uh, in the space of regenerative medicine and antibody development where you, know, you engineer uh, uh, hamster or human cell lines, you make them grow, uh, you make them change and you grow them in bioreactors to do that. So, uh, and in that space also, you need scaffolds, you need materials, you need to build structures. Uh, so we do have some of these capabilities, capabilities in, in this space. And uh, then how can we leverage and interest our scientists to apply that capability into uh, cell-based or cultivated meat? Uh, not working on hamster cells or human cells, but you know, chicken, pork. And then B cells. Uh, so that's where, where ASTAR has been really looking at what are the capabilities in Singapore, what are opportunities, how can we, you know, uh, uh, excite the scientists and build uh, 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 these programs that can extend it to, to new opportunities. Uh, so, really, that's really been ASTAR and Singapore's role in terms of extending RD to support this sector. So that was very insightful, um, which, you know, my next question is actually about, about like the what the practical experience in Singapore was, because when Impossible Burger went to Singapore, it was available in 140 different restaurants in four months. Now, I'm completely plant based. So for me, that's some sort of a dream. And I have no access to the Impossible Burger in India. <laughs> but um, Singapore is far along in, in, this, in this exciting sector. So what would it take for Singaporean companies to scale up the way Impossible has and the way Beyond has? And when do you see that happening? Hmm. Um, so I think uh, the Impossible and Beyond, you know, they are the early founders uh, of this space and, and uh, um, you know, really, uh, if we look at their trajectory, uh, the way I look at it and you can analyze it, um, uh, of course, it's good science, uh, it's good technology, uh, but it's also starting with a very clear product value proposition and differentiation uh, and um, uh, uh, a very staged approach in terms of, okay, let's start with a certain market uh, and a certain consumer segment first to make sure that uh, um, uh, they get market traction, consumer acceptance, and then you grow from there. Um, so I think for Singapore companies, uh, if I translate that, uh, of course, people say the limitations of Singapore is you have a small market. Uh, even if you go in Singapore, uh, you know, it's only five, you know, five or six million people. So one thing that I think for Singaporean companies to reach the global stage is mindset it's ambition and it's you know having that global mindset that that you want to develop something that is scalable uh, across but of course if you are a startup company and you're starting off you need to start somewhere so then the question is uh, uh, what's your product value proposition and differentiation so I, I think in summary it's about you know uh, the mindset the ambition uh, really focusing on what your product value proposition is, uh, starting with a sizable enough market uh, to grow, and then scaling up uh, across. Uh, so I, I would say that I would hope that you know one day we would have a Singapore-based company that can, you know, have a global ambition. It's, it's not impossible, uh, but uh, there, there are steps, you know, wise process that you, you need to do that, and all companies will do that. You know, there are actually a, a bunch of companies in the alternative protein sector that are in Singapore. And we hear from these companies when we speak to them, for example, like Turtle Tree Labs, you know, they, they've made, they've been very open about the fact that they have reached where they have because of the tremendous support that the Singaporean government has given them. And, you know, what I'd really, what I'd really like to like learn from you is, could you tell me a little bit about the interagency collaboration and how you're supporting these companies? Thanks. Uh, so, um, first of all, I think uh, um, 
the government support uh, and the government approach is uh, one where we try to create the best or environment that allows startup companies to grow. But coming from the government, we recognize that, that that's only one part of the equation. You know, a lot of it is also on the company and its entrepreneurs and, and founders, but we try to do our best. Um, but the, I think the, the shout out to the two Singaporean companies that you mentioned, Shok, uh, which got the recently US 13.6 million uh, Series A investment as well as Turtle Tree in June got uh, getting 3.2 million uh, seed investment. Um, uh, a big shout out to them. Uh, but going back to your question, you know, uh, how does Singapore try and an interagency approach try and create that ecosystem? Um, uh, in Singapore, I would say we, once we identify that a sector or an area is important for us, uh, we plan to death. Uh, you know, the agencies come together and we know that Singapore is small and our competitive advantage is how can we bring together the various policy makers, resources, uh, decision makers to plan for the entire growth of the ecosystem. So for example, in food, uh, uh, we have an a, a interagency work group uh, called Food Innovate. Uh, it includes the Economic Development Board, uh, which is uh, uh, responsible for attracting overseas investments into Singapore, uh, Enterprise Singapore that looks at uh, helping local startups. Uh, ASTAR has represented that as representing the public sector R&D community. Uh, we have the reg food regulators in there, the Singapore Food Agency, uh, we even have uh, the what we call the uh, it's called the Jurong Town Corporation, but it's basically the uh, master industrial land uh, planner and owner in Singapore, uh, as well as IPI, which is a, a, a government-funded uh, technology uh, brokerage and, and linkage firm. So, so as a group, then we say, you know, uh, this is a new area. How do we uh, plan, work together, and grow? Uh, this sector from all the various aspects, talent, R&D, land, regulations, uh, water environment, uh, if it's startups, uh, uh, very important is, you know, how do we also support these startups in terms of as they grow, uh, accelerators and venture capital that can support them uh, scale up uh, uh, facilities as they, you know, try and, and scale up and productize. Um, as well as uh, we are very open to, at least from the public sector r and uh, organizations. Um, uh, second scientists from our agencies to these startups, you know, so that we, you know, hopefully they get the right talent and get the boost. Um, uh, and, you know, that also uh, facilitation government support and sometimes also uh, international linkages to overseas markets. Um, so I think that's a, a very high level snapshot of how we try to plan to death uh, 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 in a sector like that in Singapore. We're small, so I think we try and leverage that for our uh, competitive advantage. So there are a lot of conversations across uh, the government agencies and uh, as far as possible, also very strong linkages with industry, whether it's uh, multinational startup companies, what are their needs, what are their problem statements, you know, uh, how can we better facilitate them uh, from these various aspects. So we, we that's uh, something of our little formula and we, we try to make that uh, successful for Singapore. Also, now this is an interesting question for me as a lawyer, particularly. I know that the SFA has been investing in building capacity within its people to sort of understand the sector, to be able to regulate it effectively. You know, so much about regulating technology involves understanding the technology first. <laughs> and um, yeah. I remember when I was in law school, we were actually studying India cyber laws because cyber laws were a big thing back then. And I think I've inadvertently um, given away my age to the audience and now everyone knows how <laughs> old I am. <laughs> But um, <clears throat> we really, in India, we really look to Singapore. We really look to your cyber laws. We learned a lot from, you know, sort of your understanding of technology. And I understand that's exactly what you're doing in the, in the space of cultivated meat, alternative proteins as well. Yeah. So do you think Singapore is going to be the first country to regulate 
and serve cultivated meat? And if yes, could you let me know by when so that I could book? <laughs> Ah, <laughs> uh, that's a very loaded question. Uh, but maybe let me go back to your original part about you know our regulators and uh, them being I I would say very progressive uh, in trying to uh, uh, put in place um, uh, a very consultative process uh, uh, in understanding the sector uh, themselves so that they can properly regulate it uh, uh, quickly. Um, so that that's really the the mindset of the Singapore Food Agency, um, and uh, I think the way that they do it is, I guess, because Singapore has already uh, the government has already announced that, you know, we have the thirty by thirty goal and and we are investing so much in R and D and you know we want to grow this sector. You know, regulation. I think uh, it's very clear signal that regulations have to catch up with technology in the market, and that's what they've been doing. Um, kudos to them, really kudos to them that um, they have been extremely open. So they've been going with us, uh, the economic agencies, uh, ASTA on uh, trips, uh, talking to various companies to understand uh, what the state of the art is, what's the manufacturing process, you know, how do we grow these cells, uh, you know. Uh, and it's through these engagements with companies uh, that they start to say, okay, this is what the process or the industry looks like. Uh, with that, then how do you regulate it from a safety, uh, you know, and a regulatory perspective? So that's really one, uh, uh, being very open to uh, uh, understand the industry. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, they are very, they have also worked with the scientists uh, and maybe uh, people with manufacturing experience. Uh, so they have been embracing experts um, across various fields to be able to advise them on what should I look out for in this part, in, in, in various parts, and then form, taking that and formulating it into a regulatory strategy. Um, the last thing I would say is that uh, they are uh, very uh, consultative uh, in that approach. So um, uh, it's not, uh, here's my regulation and that's it. Uh, because I think regulations also need to be adapted to different companies' products and processes. So, um, likewise, to many other regulatory agencies, they, they take a consultative approach. So, uh, if a company says, hey, I, I have this new product uh, uh, that they are thinking about uh, introducing to Singapore, um, the SFA is quite uh, consultative and says, okay, uh, do you have an initial regulatory dossier? This is your manufacturing process. Let me take a, take a look at it. And then I'll feed back to you what are the areas that I think I need more data, more uh, uh, um, uh, uh, information on. And so that it helps companies to be able to adapt uh, their, their product or their process uh, that ultimately uh, you know, the regulators are comfortable. Uh, so I think this is the various ingredients that uh, SFA has, has taken. Uh, will Singapore be the first? I don't know. I can't answer that question. I would say that we do hope to be one of the first. Uh, whether we're the first or not, that, I can't that, guarantee. That Kong was an entirely uh, selfish question, so I knew when book <laughs> <laughs> my tickets to come and um, to eat. So finally, could you tell me a little bit about Singapore's strategic advantages and how you manage to nurture these technologies. And, you know, I'm actually asking this question because one of our sort of visions and our dreams at GFI is to create smart protein corridors, you know, in the world. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. <clears throat> earlier when you were talking about plant protein, you mentioned that, you know, we don't like grow a lot here, you know, in, in Singapore, mm -hmm. but for example, in India, I mean, we grow mm -hmm. everything that could be used to yeah. make Yes. We grow peas, we grow potatoes, exactly. we grow it all. So it's like, is a, so personally, I feel that India and Singapore could really have a very strong partnership. And, you know, in a part of our organization's mission for smart protein, we could yes. develop a very strong smart protein corridor. So could you tell us yes. a little bit about your, the strategic advantages, how you guys manage it? and hmm. where you see the Indo-Singaporean journey going in the future. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you for that. I think it's really important. I think um, uh, my first preface to this is, 
I think this alternative protein is, uh, it will be a global industry. Um, and, uh, you know, there will be market differences, there will be sourcing differences, uh, there will, you know, the whole supply chain will, will evolve uh, as the market grows. And uh, India has, I, I, I guess if, if we were Singapore, we're like, oh, I wish I had, you know, that, that you know, agricultural base and the plant base that we could work on, uh, work off. And, and that's really uh, uh, India's advantage. And, and you have a consumer base that is already so uh, accustomed and used to plant-based food. So it, it's, it's fantastic. Um, and, and you do have uh, strong technical capabilities too, and you're growing that. Um, uh, so I think uh, India is very well poised uh, uh, to, to be a strong player in this sector. Uh, Singapore, we try to be as humble as possible and try to do our best uh, in this space. The good thing about Singapore also is that uh, it's a very cultural, diverse and small hub. So it's a very nice test bit uh, if you like a uh, fairly affluent uh, consumer base uh, uh, preference. And one advantage of Singapore is we do have a fairly nice ecosystem. Um, and uh, I, I think, and the ecosystem for alternative protein is also growing. So uh, we uh, we don't have the agricultural primary produce, but we have the plant protein ingredients players, many multinationals here, flavor and fragrances, uh, many big uh, 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 multinational end product companies, and of course that you know the the whole startup base. Uh, so the ability to do productization formulation and be able to test and, and find the right partners in Singapore is it, quite interesting uh, as a value proposition. Uh, this this can be applied and is growing for plant based, but as you know, the microbial and the, the cultured uh, uh, meat space grow, uh, I think uh, 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 the ecosystem development in Singapore, where you have the various partners coming together, uh, can be quite interesting. So I, I think that's where. Uh, I do see a lot of complementarity between India and Singapore. And likewise, I would say, you know, uh, like your original question, you know, one day if we do, if we can have Singapore based or Singapore grown companies uh, becoming regional and global, then was, I, would, I would advise them, uh, make sure you have an India strategy and make sure, you know, you understand the India market and you tap the resource, the capabilities and the market there because uh, interestingly, Asia is so diverse. Uh, you know, uh, China is different from India, from Southeast Asia to Indonesia. Um, so, um, uh, in that regard, I think there are a lot of complementarities and opportunities uh, both ways. Uh, India companies may be looking at Singapore as a, a base to to look at Southeast Asia uh, as you grow, uh, and likewise, Singapore companies, you know, uh, growing to uh, India as a huge market. Well, I just like to round this up by saying that, I mean, I hope that our conversation, I mean, you know, we at GFI have been working with, um, with uh, authorities in Singapore before. Yes. And we hope that we can only expand this work. And we really hope that, you know, perhaps in 2021, we have been able to establish a smart protein corridor between our two countries, you know, harnessing yes. the, the best from both and creating yes. something that's truly novel. So yes. thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's, it's been a wonderful conversation. And, and really, I, I, do, I do think that we should, uh, uh, between India and Singapore, work towards you know, uh, uh, a substantial partnership because we do have a lot to offer between both sides. And we at GFI, we, we just can't wait to seize the opportunity <laughs> to make this, make this partnership a reality. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, it's nice <laughs> to, to speak to you and, and have a good evening.